as Ahmed said, I'm going to go through uh, why it's important to have a quality management system, but I'm going to talk about it in two ways. So there's one aspect where you just have to have it. It's the regulations, it's required, but there's also a lot of really good reasons to have it as well, just from how you run your business and having just not a lot of wasted time or a lot of wasted uh, product. And so we'll, as we're going through this, we'll, we'll talk about both of those things. Um, so kind of just went through this. I'm a consultant. I work with medical device companies generally in the startup or the scale up phase where they have a product, it's been designed, they have a market clearance, but you know, they have sales and they're just trying to get to their sales or, and actually be able to deliver on them or actually make money. So, um, not just selling at a loss. Um, so the purpose here, uh, I'm going to just do a high level introduction of what a quality management system is, what some of the key regulations actually are. I'm not going to dive deep. By no means is this a comprehensive review. And just to be clear, this is not a substitute for any company's actual internal policies or SOPs. Uh, this is really an introduction into what this is and how it can be leveraged uh, as, as you start companies and as you scale up. Um, and like I said before, it's a bit of understanding why the regulations exist, but also how it can be used to run your business efficiently. Sorry, Sharon, I'm just going to hide that. I think it's just obscuring. Great. Um, so we're going to cover three main things. The basics of what is a quality management system, who's responsible for it, and then we'll dive into some of what those key requirements actually are. And we'll talk about it from design and development, so more of the R&D phase, and then we'll take that through to manufacturing and then some general principles after that. So first things first, like why does a QMS exist? Basically, we just don't wanna hurt people, whether it's the patient, whether it's the user, the clinician, that's the entire reason for why every clause in every regulation, every ISO standard, every IEC standard that you look at, it really is don't hurt somebody. It all comes down to that. So when you're like, why do I have to fill out this record? Well, at some point, some company probably made a decision where they didn't fill out that record and then somebody got hurt and now it's part of everybody's job to do it. That's really where it comes from. The second goal uh, tied to that or what happens after that is if you do hurt somebody, you gotta be able to respond quickly. And like, I try to really put it in like layman's terms there, no quality, no regulatory talk there. Don't hurt anybody, and if you do, respond quickly. So what I mean by respond quickly is deal with that immediate situation, deal with that patient, deal with that user, but at the same time, figure out who else could have been affected by what went wrong there, and how do you do that root cause investigation, and how do you respond to the market as a whole. So those are really the two main reasons why an entire QMS, an entire regulatory process even exists. Secondary goal is if you follow it properly and you kind of follow the spirit of what the quality management system is set up to do and not just the, the strict wording, you can actually run your business really efficiently. It will set you up to, to have really stable processes, really efficient processes, and making sure that you get the best product to the market. Um, as well as maintaining it as a market leader. So what is a quality management system? Well, uh, it's, you might've heard this term before, SOPs, so standard operating procedures. They are a collection of processes um, that are basically used to meet your quality standards and your regulatory requirements. So an SOP is a defined process, meaning it's documented, it's released in a system, it's controlled, that tells you what needs to be done, when it needs to be done by, and it also tells you who needs to do it and where the evidence that you're actually doing it will be stored. So it's not enough to just have processes that say you're going to do things. You have to be able to collect evidence, which we refer to as records, that document that you are actually following your procedures. They may or may not tell you how to actually do it. So there is flexibility in terms of where you are as a company, in terms of your startup to scale up to full commercial stage, in terms of how much control you need in there. So there's flexibility there, um, but a lot of SOPs as companies mature start to tell you exactly how to do things as well. The other thing is, is ISO 1345, which is the main medical device uh, quality standard, the regulations, they all apply to all medical devices. So everything from a Band-Aid to a pacemaker is all covered by the same set of documents, which 
means that each company in medical um, needs to determine what is appropriate for their product risks. And this is really the area that is the commonly referred to as the gray area within companies where you're discussing, well, does this apply? Like, is that too far, too much control or not? And so, but those conversations are going to happen. They're going to happen as you scale, but really it comes back to those couple things, like what could possibly hurt people and do we have enough controls in place to respond if we do? So uh, who's responsible for QMS? It's not just quality um, is basically where this slide is going. There's a lot of people and a lot of parties involved. First, you have the people who come up with your standards. So ISO 1345, so the ISO body, the FDA, Health Canada, all of them are involved in this. And then each company, like I just said, because they all cover such a wide range of things, each company is responsible for implementing it based on their medical devices and the risks of their products. And then you have the quality team. So a heavy quality team does have a heavy hand in this and they're responsible for aligning the internal processes and the internal SOPs to those external standards. But everybody in the company is really responsible for making sure that you follow the SOPs. So it's not just quality's responsibility to do that, um, if you want to be running your company sort of efficiently with standard processes, then everybody needs to be following those standard processes as well. Um, and then you have auditors. So you have internal auditors who are looking at the SOPs and looking at the evidence and making sure that they're being followed. And those are often referred to as fresh eyes. And then you have external auditors who come in and will actually give you your certification um, to say like, yes, we have audited records and you are following this and you are good to go in, in a continued manner. Slide. Sorry about that. Okay, so then um, let's get into what some of these standards actually are. So design and development. When we, when we think about the design and development process, there's boiling it down to four key steps that really take out when you see it on this, like all the hard work that actually goes into this. So first we're talking about defining our product requirements, then we're actually doing the development, then we're doing our testing, so our verification and validation, and then we're transferring to manufacturing. So if we dive into the first one there in terms of defining product requirements, well, the quality requirement there says you have to be defining your clinical use case and the benefit. So what, why are you designing this product? How is it gonna actually help in the market? What are you designing this for? And then you're linking that to what are referred to as user requirements and product specifications. So basically you're deriving what does your product actually need to do? And then how is your product going to look and feel in order to, to do that. As part of that, you need to document your clinical risks. So how can this hurt the patient or harm the user? So it's not always patient focused, it's really the whole ecosystem that you are putting your device into. So it could be a clinician, it could be a pharmacist, it could be whoever is just interacting with your device and of course the patient as well. And then you're creating a plan for this design and development phase. So you're defining certain milestones, who needs to be involved, who needs to review, review which documents. And those are the requirements just from the quality system itself. But from a company perspective, we, we just wanna be doing that for a few reasons. First is it's really good to know what you're designing and why it gets cross-functional buy-in on when you're ready to go to market. So if you meet all of those requirements, and then somebody says, actually, we should start adding these additional features. Well, you have something to go back to and say, well, we said that this was good enough for the market. And it helps avoid scope creep in that sense. But on the other hand, if a new feature is being requested or, or whatnot, you have that conversation, that vehicle to have that discussion of, do we need to update our product requirements? Second, the planning portion. Um, I've worked in startups as, as things go quickly you often stop to forget to plan, but the planning portion really does create clarity in, in the long term in terms of what is needed, who is responsible for what, especially when you start moving away from you know, companies that are four people and you get to companies that are 40 or 50 people, you need to have some organization and structure in there as well. So now we're into the development side. This is where a lot of the, the engineering, the hard work, the late nights, this all comes into play here. Um, QMS doesn't really cover how many hours you're supposed to work and things like that. That's all, that's OSHA, that's HR, that's, that's different policies. Um, what the QMS is talking about here is really keeping a couple things in mind. First is patient and user risks. As you're making design decisions, are you 
picking parts that have enough reliability um, to maintain product performance so that you're not, uh, you're not risking anything for the user. Or are you making a cost trade-off and perhaps picking parts that aren't as reliable but might fail and might cause user harm? So that's really what it's trying to mitigate against when we talk about risks is products or part selection, design choices, things like that. Um, and when I was talking earlier about always having evidence, this is this is kind of the bane of the, de the, the development process. It's like you have to be documenting as you go. You're documenting your design decisions. You're even providing evidence as to who approved those decisions. Um, this, these two things together are really important. Um, from a business perspective, first, it by like looking at your risks, well, you can prioritize your actions, your design decisions, your costs based off of things that are going to cause the most risk to the patient. Um, but then the documentation, while it is required from a QMS perspective, it's also helpful to have, because you then start to have a historical uh, reference as to why things were made, what testing was done, what didn't work. So when your team grows, because the goal of all startups is that you grow and you start developing, you start hiring, you start developing more products. Well, you can say like, why didn't we pick that capacitor? And then you can go back and be like, oh, because it failed, um, because it doesn't work. Uh, and we have that in our, in our documentation. Um, so then you've done the hard work, you've designed your product, you've built a couple, you're like, this is great, this is what I'm gonna do. So the next step is testing. So verification and validation covers testing. A lot of times it just gets lumped into one term of VNV and it's great, it's great to go, but verification and validation actually mean two different things. And so um, verification is that when you're testing what you've built and it, you have built what you've intended to. So it meets your product specifications. Meaning if you said you're going to build a box that's nine by nine by nine plus or minus one on each side, well then you've got a box that's nine by nine by nine plus or minus one on each side. That's great, you've verified that. But validation is great. Does that box have any clinical use? Does that box meet that clinical use requirement that you initially uh, set out to solve? or that problem that you set out to solve. So validation tests against the clinical use and the user requirements, whereas verification tests against the product specifications. There can be overlap, those things are acceptable, but, ge but generally you are looking at it from two different uh, perspectives. From a business perspective, you really should be testing product before it goes to the market. Um, this makes sure that your product is going to work in the field. No V and V goes smoothly despite any bench testing that happens as you do your builds and everything that you've learned through your design and development. So really what you're doing through VNV, even if you accept the design and send it to the market, is you're learning a lot more about your product. You are setting things up to say, well, you know what? We've actually identified a, a set of failures. They're not risky. They're not gonna cause patient harm or user errors, but they are gonna cause non-safety related faults and we're gonna have issues in the field. So you generally end up with a hit list of sustaining changes that you wanna make after you've launched the market. Um, so it's really good, it's really helpful for understanding your product limitations um, and really knowing you know, what's gonna, what issues are we gonna have in the field, what's gonna be returned, why, how do we, how do we plan for that? Okay, I'm gonna come back to records. Uh, I know I talked about it a bit, um, but there is kind of a saying in medical of, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So um, if you talk to your boss and your boss is like, yeah, that's fine. I know we normally order these parts from DigiKey, but go ahead and order them from McMaster Car. It's totally fine. Uh, if that decision is not documented and you do that anyways, and something goes wrong, well, then that's, that's against the quality system requirements. So and there's two main types of records. Um, that come out of design and development. The first is your design history file. This is the compilation of all of those design decisions that were made, whether it's meeting minutes, test reports, um, planning documents, everything that basically says, this is why we decided upon this being the design that we want to put in the, into the market. The second half is the device master record, and that is basically your blueprint for what you're building. It's your product specifications, your drawings, your work instructions, your test procedures, things that you're gonna be following every single time when you go and build an, 
uh, build a product and manufacture it. Um, I do still think that there is value in records. I know I have written a lot of records that once they get released, nobody ever looks at them again. <laughs> uh, they may or may not show up in an audit, um, but a lot of times there are there are records that do have a lot more value to add to them. And that is the ones where you are actually talking about why you made the decision that you did um, or understanding the limits of when you make a change. Well, how, how's that going to impact the product and the performance? I am a very strong believer in very good DMR records. Um, I've spent a lot of time in manufacturing and having a complete DMR um, with specifications and good tolerance and like an understanding the tolerances and the work instructions really sets you up to actually be able to build your product consistently on a regular basis and when you get to having the point of having sales you want to be able to promise your customer a, a time when you're actually going to be able to get it to them and if you don't know what's going to go wrong in manufacturing because you don't have good a good dmr you're not going to be able to deliver on that consistently um the other reason to have all these records is going back to that portion of like, when something goes wrong, you want to be able to respond quickly. These records become key in terms of being able to do that. So I'm gonna talk about change control. Um, I'm not sure if people have seen the, the image on the left where it talks about how easy it is to make a change where, depending on where a product is in the life cycle. So, if you're still in the design development, if you're further on the left, you're like trying to figure out what your product is gonna look like, nothing is kind of set in stone. It's pretty easy to make a change. As you go through the product life cycle, as you launch to market, you it gets harder and harder to make a change because as you're making a change, well, it starts to impact other decisions that you've already made. Um, one of the things with medical devices is we always launch to the field, to the, to the market, we get our clearance, and then we're always making sustaining changes. Um, it's, it's common, it's, it's what we do as an industry. It's not true in pharma. So if anybody's gonna go into pharma, like once you launch to manufacturing, your manufacturing is validated. You can't update anything without revalidating, re getting your clearances all over again. So we have a lot more flexibility in medical devices. Um, Though sometimes when you're in the weeds of it, it doesn't feel that way, but it's nice to just remember that. Um, so when it comes to change control, while we have that flexibility, the expectation is that we are considering changes holistically. So it might seem really small, like you just wanna open up the tolerance on, on a component. And, but you have to go back and you have to assess, well, does that change your risk? Does that add any risk? Does that um, impact any product requirements? Is that going to change how you can deliver on your specifications? You have to talk about why you're changing it. Um, while we all make changes on a regular basis, generally not accepted to just be like, hmm, we didn't really like our initial product. Um, or we knew that this wasn't so good, but we launched it to the market anyways. Not a great reason. Um, so, so discussing why you made it, but then also discussing, well, how does that impact product that's already built? So. If you're making this for a safety related reason, well, does that mean that everything that you've already built in the field is unsafe? And do you have to pull that back? Do you have to do a recall and, and fix all of, the, all of that? Um, you also need to be considering the impact to your interfacing assemblies, your processes. Does this impact your work instructions, your incoming inspection, any equipment that is either used to measure this part or that this part goes into? And more recently, more and more regulatory bodies are saying, well, if you made a change on product line A and you have a similar product line B, you should be making the change on product line B too. So this is kind of something that's been evolving and the EU in particular is very, very uh, into that. From a business purpose, um, first, like this just keeps the product on the market, a good product that's on the market, but also it really brings in cross-functional awareness of of changes and creates the ability to sort of plan for and execute changes. If you are discussing change control up front, then nobody's surprised to go like, actually, we need to go and update our regulatory filing. So everything that you just worked on for the last three months when you sourced parts and tested them and you're like, this is good to go, just joking, we are six months behind because now we need to do a regulatory update. So cross-functional awareness, this discussion of changes is important to be happening up front. Um, and also a lot of times once you're in manufacturing, 
well, you start to get into, well, how am I gonna manage my inventory? I already have purchase orders that are open, parts that are gonna be coming in, so how does that, how does that tie together? Okay, transfer to manufacturing. So you've got your product, it's tested, it's good to go. Well, how are we gonna build this consistently? I had a boss once tell me that in R&D, you build things five, 10 times, and in manufacturing, you build the same thing over and over and over and over again. So whether it's 10,000 or 100,000 times, depending on the product, it is, you're thinking about the same product very differently. So this comes back to a lot of things that get covered in that device master record. So you're looking to define your processes, your work instructions. Uh, you need to qualify your equipment so you can't just be getting calipers that were sitting around in your garage and being like, these are good, I swear. Um, you want to make sure that your equipment is calibrated and is maintained. You want to identify your internal testing. What testing are you going to do within your, uh, within your process? And along the same lines, if you're going to be using a sample size or you're not going to be testing 100%, well, what's that sample size going to be? What's the justification for that sample size? And can you validate that process to say, this is why we're not testing every single, every single part? You want to have suppliers that are, you want to know where you're going to be getting your parts from. During the pandemic, this concept of supply chain and supply chain issues and understanding where things are sourced from, whether it's medical or, or just furniture, things like that became more and more important. Um, and it's because you want to have a reliable supply chain. You want to know when you're going to get parts. Um, you want to have people in-house. You want to train them. They need to know what they're building. They often need to, they often like to know why they're building it so that they have some buy-in to what's happening as a company. And you need facilities. Like you need a place to manufacture uh, as well, which may or may not include something like a clean room or, um, or just kind of special lighting or special equipment, things like that. The entire reason to spend time on transfer to manufacturing is because you are going, because you want to have a consistent process that allows you to build product in an ongoing fashion. And it's important in manufacturing to be able to predict how much you're going to be able to build so that you can know how much, how much product to order, how much is, how much we're going to lose to yields. Even if the yields are bad, just knowing them helps you plan. Um, the other thing is, is documenting processes that don't require institutional knowledge to build because when that key engineer moves on to a different role, moves on to a different product or leaves to go to a different company, well then all of a sudden you're like, nobody in this company knows how to build this product. Um, and that's not a great place to be either. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about manufacturing. I know I distilled design and development down into four and then I've expanded manufacturing out into seven. Uh, but we're going to go the, all the way from supplier selection right to distribution. Can I get, there's no time on this. Can I get a time check? Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's 4.30. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so supplier controls. Why an incoming inspection? Why do we care about this? Well, we want to be selecting suppliers that can reliably give us the product that we're asking for. And we use incoming inspection as a way to actually make sure that they're giving product that we ask for. There is a lot of variability here in terms of like, well, the supplier providing a, the decal with our company logo is not nearly as important as the supplier providing our transformer. Um, that's it. And my boyfriend works in marketing, so to him, the marketing logo is very important. To me, I don't care. Um, but you, so you want to control your suppliers based off of the risk of the part that they're providing. Um, and that, that means checking out their technical abilities. Can they actually make this part? Are you asking a machine shop to do injection molding? Probably not a great, not a good fit. Um, but also looking at their quality management system. So they don't necessarily have to be 13485 compliant, but do they have controls in place so that they, they know that they're not sending you bad product? Because what you don't want is suppliers who knowingly send you bad product and then just cross their fingers and hope you don't catch it. Um, because they, cause it happens, by the way, this is, this is all from my life experience. Um, where where they will do that, and they're not suppliers that you want on your approved supplier list. They're not ones that you want to continuously be ordering from. 
Um, quality, other quality requirements are, you have to actually be reviewing them in an ongoing fashion. So it's not enough to just select them during the initial engineering phase and say, yeah, they're good. We got parts from them for, you know, our prototype builds. They're good for manufacturing forever. You're doing a consistent check on them to, to look at, well, what have the incoming inspection records said? You're auditing them on a periodic basis and that period can be defined based off of the, the risk of the supplier. Um, and you're basically managing them as you would if they were internal. And more and more focus over the last few years has gone into managing your suppliers and your sub suppliers, like who is supplying to them. And this is more and more of a focus on controlling your supply chain end to end. Because at the very end of the day, even if your supplier makes a mistake, if that faulty product ends up harming somebody, you are still the legal manufacturer. So you are still the one taking on the risk for that device. Um, and that's why you wanna have all of these controls in place. Um, also from a business perspective, I would say that having good supplier control means that you can have a predictable uh, supply chain and material management process. Meaning, well, if you order a hundred parts, you know when you're gonna get those parts you know how many of them are gonna be good, and then you know that, well, I'm gonna get 100 parts, 100 of them are gonna be good, so when I go to build 100 products, I can build 100 products, not I get 100 parts, I don't know what the yield is gonna be, could be 50, could be 90, uh, so when I go to build, maybe I'll get 100, maybe I'll get 50, I'm not sure, and that all comes back to, can you meet your customer expectations? Can you deliver on the ship date that you, that you promised? So they send you the 100 parts, what do you do with them? And, and you've inspected them and they're all good. So there are actual quality requirements around how you store and handle your materials, which I think is often overlooked. Um, but basically what they are asking for here, and this often comes down to traceability. Um, so when you hear about material traceability or lot handling or serial numbers, things like that, a lot of that is because if something goes wrong in the field, you want to be able to look at the serial number of that component or the lot of that component and then be able to scope your issue in the field to a specific batch or to a specific serial number. If it's, if it's not design related and it's manufacturing related, then you want to be able to limit what is impacted and what your actions in relation to that are. Um, so the quality requirements are being able to find your inventory, physically find it. So if you got a hundred parts in that batch and one in the field has gone awry and has created an adverse event, well then you want to go be able to find where your 99 other parts are. And if you have 40 in manufacturing still, you want to go and physically get those 40 very quickly and put them in a non-conforming area. Um, you want to know which part numbers and which revisions are on your shelf. Um, so you actually have to be able to identify different parts and different revisions. And you want to know which material is ready to use. So if parts have come in, but they haven't gone through incoming inspection, um, those are those are not ready to use, and so you're not you're not good to proceed with those. And same with non-conforming material or customer returned materials. So if you get stuff back from the field, well, there's all these quality requirements around. All of those things need to be in different different places, identified differently, handled differently as well. From a business purpose, I've kind of gone through some of those already, but I would also say that having a good understanding of what your inventory levels are and where your parts are in your production process allows you to also know when you need to order parts. So it prevents production shortages where you're like, okay, great, I'm ready to build a hundred parts. I've got, you know, part one, two, three, I don't have part four and that's got an eight week lead time on it. So my production is down for eight weeks. Um, that's not a good place to be. And then similarly, if you have parts just kind of scattered all over your production facility. Um, it makes it hard for the technician who's building your parts to actually know where to get those parts. We talk about non-conforming materials. So ideally when you start building, everything is great. Everything's built to specifications. That's not gonna happen 100% of the time. So from a quality requirement perspective, you really need to be segregating non-conforming material um, the main goal from a quality perspective is to make sure that only conforming material is shipped to the customer. Um, they want you to be able to root cause non-conformances and action on any of the other product that might be affected. So if you have found a, an issue with a specific batch, 
but it actually turns out it's a tolerancing issue on the design, well then you need to go and look at all of the things that could be affected. So it comes down to the scope of the problem as well. From a business perspective, this is, this is a very powerful process that can be leveraged um, a lot to understand where are things going wrong in production. So once you've kind of tackled the things that are causing user risks, well, you can then be tackling things that, you know, cause production slowdowns, cause uh, parts to be scrapped, cause additional costs. So you basically want to be able to like only build good product. So you can prioritize based off of how often things are happening, how much it's costing the company, and then implement what design or process or equipment changes to prevent recurrence. So this is a very powerful process if you are actually collecting the data and trending it and then actioning your manufacturing engineers, your design engineers to solving those root causes. Records. They exist in manufacturing too. Um, basically, so we talked before about the design history file and the device master record. Those are things that come out of the design and development. In manufacturing, we have what is referred to as a device history record. So this is basically the history of every component that went into the product that you shipped based off of the lot or the serial number. Um, it's evidence that you built your product to your device master record. Um, it's evidence that your technician who did the final testing was trained on that test procedure and trained on how to interpret your results. It's a lot of records based off of that. From a business perspective, if something goes wrong in the field, you're gonna be looking back at these records to be like, well, what, what is the actual product that went wrong? Um, yeah. I have a question like, does the design file and all of this file should be for medical device, uh, FDA approved or? So it depends on the, um, the stage in the company where you are. So. Each DHR that gets produced is not sent to the FDA. That's maintained locally within the company. There is generally an approval process to say somebody in the company has the ability to go through the records and say that they do meet the device master record um, and this product is good to ship. Um, so that is reviewed on a, uh, before each lot actually ships. Does that answer your question? No, yeah, you. perfect. Great. Um, the other reason to have these records is well, if you are going to make a change, um, then you have some data to look at to say, did this actually improve the process, did it not? Um, especially when you're talking about process changes or equipment changes. Um, the last reason why it's really good to have these records is especially when it comes to software changes being implemented in the field. Well, you wanna be tracking what software was initially loaded on it. Does that, is that one in need of the update or not? Things like that. So as you're making changes to the field, it's great to know what uh, configuration of the device was actually shipped. Okay, I'm gonna go through the last few slides fairly quickly in terms of some general things. So your product's in the field, uh, it's being used by the market, it's great, except that sometimes not all the customers like it, it doesn't always work, sometimes things go very awry. So this is why we have complaint handling and adverse event procedures. So ideally, Nobody ever has to deal with this. Practically, everybody has to deal with this. Um, this all comes back to, if something goes wrong, be able to respond quickly. Um, and it's not always patient harm. It could just be, it's not functional and things still get sent back. So when it comes to these procedures, when there is a complaint, when a customer calls you up and says, hey, my product's not working, it's important that there's an immediate review. And it's because if there was an adverse event where adverse event is caused by serious patient, or sorry, is defined by serious patient harm, every country has a slightly different wording on that. But if it does cause something like death, well then you have legal requirements to report into your different regulatory regions within 24 or 48 hours. Um, so it's quick. So when I say immediate review, I don't mean like, whoops, my bad, I was on long weekend. Um, it's, it's actually, an immediate review. So you generally have somebody looking at these every day as they come in and doing that assessment. Um, you're investigating the root cause. So why, why are they complaining? Was it a user error? Was it a design issue? Was this even a use case that we intended to design for? Um, figuring out what went wrong, why maintaining records for changes. So if you went and you had to replace some, a part that's in the field, um, that's fine, you're totally allowed to do that. You're allowed to service your equipment. 
Um, but you have to maintain records, and this goes back to having traceability to the devices that are in the field. Um, and then you also don't want to be building more non-conforming products. So if you're getting a whole bunch of complaints in because something is failing, well, you don't want to continue to ship more product that looks that is going to fail. And especially if it's failing in a harmful way, you want to be able to tell all the other customers who have that product to stop using it. Um, yes. Do you mind speaking closer? Oh, to that? sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so from a business perspective, beyond all of those benefits, we also want to be talking about um, like understanding the customer needs. So this is really where your customers are calling you back. They're giving you feedback. They're telling you what they actually like and don't like about your device, mostly don't like, um, and you are responding to that. Um, it also helps talking about customer satisfaction. So sometimes you're in a really sort of unique or specialized field where you might not be getting Yelp reviews or Google reviews or things like that. But if you are selling directly to customer, you might, those things might be important and especially on social media and maintaining your customer satisfaction ratings. Um, corrective and preventive actions are basically anytime something didn't work, whether it's design related or a uh, quality system, mm -hmm. if something doesn't work and it's kind of trending and it's happening several times, well, then you need to be identifying why it's happening, implementing solutions to address that gap. Um, and this is, this is also really important to be like for near misses or things that almost went wrong but didn't quite um, because you want to be able to prevent things uh, before they happen. That's the ideal. So that's where preventive actions come in. From a business perspective, as you are, uh, as you're running your company, as you're seeing some of these things, um, things either falling through the cracks, whether it's like quality systems not followed or just really inefficient processes, well, it kind of creates a prioritized list of where to focus to just improve your business processes, your efficiencies. The last portion here is management involvement and data review. So from a quality system, you are required to have regular, regularly scheduled management review. There's actually like defined requirements for what your executive management team needs to be involved in and what they're driving from a quality management perspective. Um, and that includes uh, discussions around compliance, any concerns, any risks related to the quality management system and driving a culture of following your QMS within the company. Um, from a business perspective, this is this is again processes that, if used well, can really be leveraged to use data to understand. Well, these are my top customer complaints. So, and this is from a root cause perspective. A lot of things are coming down to, you know, work instruction errors. So we need to hire another manufacturing engineer to clean up our work instructions, or we need to look at different supplier selections, or we need to identify different equipment or a different design change. Um, to address these things. So when, when used properly, you can actually be collecting a lot of data to, to direct how you do your work, um, to make your product better and then make your processes better as well. Great. Uh, any questions?